Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and Gentlemen, veuillez accueillir, please welcome Carla Bailo, Rashmi Erdvaresh, en conversation avec In Conversation with Brice Lalonde. Good afternoon. Ooh. Circularity. That's the new dimension of sustainable development. How can we alleviate the harvesting of natural resources? How can we better use the resources? We use them, recycle them. We're already asking a lot to the automotive industry. And so this is the last new challenge, very important challenge. I have the big luck to be with two very influential and important persons. Both of them are chairing the research institution one in the United States, that is Carla Bailo. She's in charge of the Center for Automotive Research. And uh, Rashmi Udvaverse, she's chairing the uh, Automotive Research uh, Association of India. So that's fantastic to be there. It's, I mean, this is the future of the automotive industry here in India and the United States, probably in the world. So you're going to have questions <laughs> in the end. So you're going to use your slido, slido <laughs> in the, the clicker. Uh, um, application, so please, uh, uh, please do it. And um, I would first start by asking both of them, perhaps we we'll start with you, Ashmi, what's your idea of the circular economy? How would you integrate this idea in what you're doing in all your projects? Thank you, Brice. And uh, let me begin, first of all, in wishing everybody a very happy environmental day today. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I represent an organization uh, which is 52 years old. Um, it was set up as an independent research and development organization for the country, and therefore have seen the growth of uh, Indian um, automotive industry very closely. The way I look at circular economy is minimizing the waste and obviously making the most of our resources. It's kind of uh, built into the Indian ethos, the way um, circularity is defined. Um, I would rather touch upon it more philosophically, if you permit. Please, please. And uh, the, uh, the Indian concept is any, anything that is born, either uh, human or any living, or even um, non-living, is made from five principles. They are called Pancha Mahabhuta, five principles uh, which are earth, air, water, fire, and sky. And what it means is it originates from these and it ends into these. And that's what is the circularity. And during its course of life span, uh, the utilization is derived out of uh, the product. That's how I look at it. So it's familiar to you? Yes. So something which goes deep into the Indian culture? I think so. Right. -o. So, Kala, what is the circular economy and how does it apply to all what you're doing? I like to think of circularity as kind of the new mobility ecosystem. And uh, when we think about that, we define it as the triple zero, which is zero accidents and fatalities, if you look at the number of, of deaths on the freeway in the, in the US, it's about the equivalent of a 737 crashing every day. Globally, it's about the equivalent of a 777 crashing every day, with 94% of that being caused by human error. So clearly, if we can do as much as possible to remove the human element out of the vehicle, it will definitely help with safety. Secondly is zero carbon footprint. And that means end-to-end. -end. So you have to think about not just what's coming out of the tailpipe, but also how you manufacture the components that go into the product and how you recycle those components at the end of the day. It all adds up to the total carbon footprint, and it has to all be considered in the circularity. And lastly is zero stress, because to really solve a lot of the mobility problems that we have and move to a multimodal society, you really need to have zero stress of not only the people in the vehicle, the passengers in the vehicle, but 
also the vulnerable road users, the bicyclists, the pedestrians, the persons with disabilities. The whole ecosystem has to feel safe and secure in however you create that mobility system. Okay, so we'll have to get to the, how do we do that? Okay, um, perhaps um, uh, ask me, um, uh, when we spoke before, you were keen to talk about the regulatory framework, saying what, what is important is we need a regulatory framework if we want to move further. Can you perhaps uh, develop that? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, I would just uh, relate to the Indian situation uh, today. Uh, as we are talking here, uh, we have about uh, 200 million vehicles wow. uh, on Indian roads. And if you look at their age, um, almost, say, 35 million and more vehicles uh, older than 15 years. So we have a big challenge there. And as I said earlier, uh, it's uh, into Indian ethos of using what we have, uh, using it to the fullest extent. So unless there is a business case or unless uh, there is an uh, incentive for getting um, the old vehicles off the road, it's not going to improve the situation. So the user looks at it from his usability point of view, but its a negative impact on environment is something which has to be supplemented by regulations. So that's what uh, I look at it. Um, also, um, one-time cleaning up of the fleet is something which government should do. And uh, I'm proposing to the Indian government to take that as an initiative, one-time cleaning up, and then on a regular basis introduce a system of retiring unfit vehicles. That's the way we look at uh, the uh, chain of events. So let's hope um, all, the, all the industry is going to follow you and, and agree with what you're also existing. Can we, we've been discussing a lot, and in these uh, meetings, we have um, uh, the idea of uh, mobility as a service. And uh, there's been lots of examples of this. Uh, Carla, do you think um, uh, this idea of mobility as a service can be one of the part of the concept of circularity? And how can we think of, you know, of this and to, and to put it in the framework of circularity? Yeah, mobility as a service, we're seeing it crop up everywhere. All different kinds of companies are doing it, everything from automotive companies to new startups. And we're seeing a younger population today that, quite frankly, doesn't want to buy a car or can't afford to buy a car. And they don't want the burden of ownership. They want to be able to what we call usership um, and only pay for what they utilize. So when we think about how mobility as a service can work, it's going to be a complete disruption to how automakers work today. Automakers are really good at designing, building, and selling cars to dealers. They're not really the greatest at providing services to their customers. So if we think about that evolution of the, of the driver into a mobility service package, what does that mean? It means we're not sure if it's going to mean more vehicles or less vehicles, quite frankly. There are some people that are saying it will be more vehicles, even though those vehicles will be shared. Um, we don't know. It depends what kind of packages end up coming up. But fundamentally, it can become like the airline industry in a lot of ways, where the vehicles are just continually reused and put in service, and the, uh, so, to, so to speak, the brains and the interiors get updated to meet the customer expectations. And it can be customized for the customer. So the vehicles, in essence, could have a longer shelf life, and then at the end of the day, you could then recycle and, and reuse certain components. I think one of the most interesting cases is mobility as a service is really great for electrified vehicles in urban populations. Then we have the issue with the batteries and reuse of all those batteries, either supplementing the grid or supplementing personal homes. There's many, many uh, second usages. But as we develop all of these different new ways of mobility and electrification, we need to be thinking about that end use as well um, and not just be bringing out products without thinking about how we're going to reuse or recycle at the end of the day. <laughs> okay. So how can we achieve this? I mean, after all, this, this, 
means your, your car would never, would never stop. It was always being running. The only way you're going to make money with mobility as a service is if you have a car that never stops. And we've seen that with Uber, Lyft, and everyone who's tried so far. You know, it's the deadheading of rides. It's, it's just like doing a logistics company or managing supply chain. You never want that, that ocean liner to be empty or you never want that truck to be empty because every time dollars are just flowing out of the back of it, wherever it goes. So these are the, the things that we're going to have to have a lot more data analytics to ensure that the cars never stop. We have to understand how the people are moving about our municipalities and create modes of operation to enable them to get around. You know that we have these new models now in uh, utilities and electricity. And the new model is the electricity utility is not there to sell more and more electricity, but to help its customers to save electricity. So this means also for the car industry, it's going to produce less cars, but cars which are going to be used much better. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the million dollar question. We don't know. <laughs> um, you know, as we've started to roll out some of these mobility service companies, um, we've seen some that have actually caused um, personal ownership to be dis decreased in certain areas. We've seen others where we've seen an increase because we have people now with cars driving for these services that didn't have a car before. So we're studying that data very, very carefully, and it's something that we call unintended consequences. Yeah. We could actually be making the situation worse. Take New York City for a great example. Since Uber and Lyft launched there, there's been about a... 17% decrease in use of public transit, and the roads are more crowded than ever between Uber's Lyft taxis and, of course, e-commerce booming, so the trucks are blocking all the lanes, too. So now um, New York is one of the first cities to actually put in a taxation for uh, congestion pricing. First one in the, in the U.S. to try this. They have to do something because it's such a mess. Um, but we have to watch these things and analyze it, and it's an ongoing, everyday process to see what it's eventually going to mean. If indeed the number of vehicles does go down, that's why it's so important for the automotives to be in the game of mobility services. Yes, thank you. That's nice to know. We don't exactly know what's going to happen. We're trying and we're moving. Yeah. Yes, okay. But of course, you talked about trucks and... Uh, Trust me, there's not only cars. Uh, yes. I mean, there's also trucks. There's also two wheels. Can you? Two wheelers. Yeah. Can you can you say a word about the the circular trucks or the circular two wheels? Well, um, two wheelers are relatively easier to handle because uh, their usage is uh, at least uh, in our country is uh, you know handled by one person or in the family and it's maintained well. Um, its, uh, it's utility is also very high. You know, it's efficient. But on the other side, if you look at uh, the data uh, which is coming out of our research on ambient air quality measurements, which we recently published a report for uh, the most polluted city, that is Delhi, uh, out of the uh, uh, transport-related contribution, 25% is come in, I'm talking about PM, it's coming out of uh, two wheelers. And 27% is coming out of trucks. Uh -huh. So both these are very, very important for us. Um, two wheelers because of the sheer number, and obviously trucks because they are not maintained well, they are overloaded, they, are, uh, they have reached already end of life. So these two sectors become very important for us. Um, so uh, if you look at the uh, development of uh, regulatory support, um, at this moment, two-wheelers and trucks are not covered in the regulations. So uh, I think there's a need for us to address specifically these two sectors. I, I like to me, you know, the two wheels uh, in, some, in some countries, uh, there's so many bicycles. They get stolen, and so if, when your bicycle is stolen, you just steal another one, and you have your <laughs> all these bicycles. In, it's like a pool if you want, and people help themselves uh, with the bicycles. But now we've got all the you know the, the free bicycle, you sharing, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I'm a cyclist, so I, I like to talk about the bicycles. Never forget it. It's such an important also tool. 
So, the whole life of the product. So, how can we, you know, um, uh, ma make sure that um, uh, we think about um, uh, the circularity not only at the end, uh, or, or you know, when you produce something? How how can we make sure? Um, uh, you talked about updating, updating. Uh, in some countries, it's the driver who's updated because he has to re, you know apply for his license again because he's getting a little old, he made a mistake, etc. Et so everybody has to be updated. Mm. How can a car be updated? Is, <laughs> it, is it possible? I mean, ask me, is it, is it something which goes deep into the culture of India also? Very, very, uh, very valid point and very much possible. In fact, I will uh, highlight here one experiment which was done 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, where the Supreme Court of India uh, governed and they announced that the entire uh, bus uh, fleet of Delhi city should be converted into compressed natural gas. So you can actually do that? Yes, it was done and it is very successfully running. And in fact, uh, if you look at today's uh, CNG, uh, compressed natural gas, uh, vehicle population is about 3.2 million vehicles. Uh, it's doing its bit and it's possible. It's not just uh, um, the CNG, I think various other experimentation, complete electrification of in-use vehicles is being tried out. There is in India something called, you know, the low-tech um, uh, do-it-yourself uh, update, recycle, uh, repair. How do you call that uh, movement? Uh, Jugaad. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Probably it can apply a well, little. Well, uh, not just the Jugaad way. It's proper scientific uh, and uh, engineered, better engineered products is something which will uh, do very good thing. That's great. And, yeah. and Carla, you, you yeah. had some ideas. I, I was very impressed by something you said. I mean, cars are going to be computers with three wheels, or four wheels, sorry. Oh, <laughs> okay. some, some will be three. <laughs> some will be three. <laughs> Depending. Um, you can update the product in many ways. The interesting thing for me is if you want to update the mechanicals or let's say parts that wear out or door panels or the carpet, we have to design the car completely differently. For example, if you needed to replace the front carpet of a vehicle today, you'd have to remove the entire IP and the entire center console. It's impossible to do that cheaply and to do it well and then put the car back together. So you have to almost start designing a car like a Lego product, you know, and, and really think it, when you design it, about which parts are going to be needed to be replaced and updated. When it comes to the brains of the car, you can do that over the air today, and many manufacturers already are. We're going to start seeing a lot more of that over there updates that will come to you, and you can choose when you want it to download, and then your car will just be updated, be it the latest map, be it the latest programming, be it the latest way that your engine is communicating with your transmission and your shift patterns everything uh, can be updated and we'll see more and more of that it's already starting um, the vast majority of your car today is truly electronic yes and lots of the added value of a car is now electronic that's a that's a problem for the automakers by the way because they don't always know how to do the software uh, part. this this is why they have to partner with other people you know people that are used to dealing with consumer experiences better with human machine interface and uh, this is why we're seeing all of the partnerships cropping up between the automakers and be it, uh, you know, the, the Googles or the Apples or those people that really understand. And it's moving so quickly, you don't have time to build that expertise in-house. So you really have to partner with others. So how long is, going to, how long is it uh, the future cars, future vehicles, how long are they going to live? I mean, um, uh, if you update it all the time, <laughs> it can last forever. <laughs> I think it's the mechanical side that's going to be the problem. You know, eventually things just wear out. And if we designed a car to go 500,000 to a million miles, you wouldn't like that car. It would be like a tank. So, uh, you know, it, there's got to be a balance there. But definitely, I think you'll see life cycles in the 15 to 20 year range. Already there are vehicles on the road that long, not many. Thank heavens, but uh, definitely you will be able to continue to, to update them. 
And it's going to depend. We're going to have all kinds of products. There's even going to be little personal pods that will just be used for first mile, last mile. Those can stay around for a long, long time, depending on the mechanicals and, and the way they're designed. Yeah, using the parts is something which can always be uh, very useful in the um, uh, circularity of economy. But in my view, um, re-engineering a product uh, has its own limitation. Um, it can take to a certain level, and I talked about the CNG experiment. Yes, it increased uh, its usability, its uh, performance, uh, its uh, impact on environment, etc. But within its uh, total lifespan, so we can't expect um, complete changeover of lifestyle. Okay, so that's that's good news for the for the industry. You you have to produce new cars, uh, uh, of course. Okay, but uh, you don't need to produce them as fast as you produce cell phones, probably. Yeah. And uh, so, but it's important. So you know we have to know that because now more and more you have these regulations uh, in European Union or, or elsewhere. You have to recycle. So you have uh, at the end of the life of the car. Um, the last owner has to take care, uh, bring it somewhere, um, see that it's uh, recycled. Uh, first, it's clean. You take off all the, the dirty stuff uh, and you recycle it, etc. And, and I, I think this is very important. Already today, steel is, is recycled. You can recycle steel, I don't know how many times, oh. aluminium also, etc. I think the main problem will be that now you have these engineers, very smart engineers, inventing incredible composite products, plastic, but you can't recycle them. So at one moment, you have to have a, a decision of the automakers or the, or the public authorities saying, hey, you guys, please uh, choose a, a material which can be recycled and reused. I don't know what's happening in your countries for, for the recycling part of the end of the life. Yeah, um, in my view, a resource uh, in one context uh, becomes a waste uh, for others and vice versa, a waste for one process is a resource for another. And therefore, unless uh, there is a business case, um, better structured uh, way of recycling doesn't happen. Um, so that's where I see a great need for regulating uh, this industry. Obviously, the industry exists for recycling the vehicles, but needs regulations and uh, uh, that's, that's how uh, we, I look at it. And we are working very closely with this industry. Um, I will also share with you that, uh, uh, for example, ship uh, wrecking industry. Uh, ships are uh, arriving at India and Bangladesh and Pakistan. And uh, that's a very big industry, in fact. Um, it employs a whole lot of people about uh, 30,000, 40,000 at least from the belt where it goes. So there is a lot of economy. And the same thing is happening for um, vehicle end of life uh, infrastructure as well. Yeah, fundamentally, um, the automakers are very serious about recycling. Um, for example, most of the steel and aluminum that's utilized to make the components, about 94 to 95% of that goes back into the next product. So it is recycled. All of the scrap material gets recycled. Plus, there's a, a, a lot of emphasis now on designing the part to make as little scrap as possible, um, including uh, secondary operations, etc. cetera. Um, also, when we get into carbon fiber or in polymeric materials, a lot of those pellets and a lot of the scrap can be reused. And again, the manufacturing of the component itself can be designed in such a way that you have very little scrappage. Um, Ford just announced two days ago with their underbody panels, which are polymeric materials, they use 200, about 200 of the old water bottles that go into making those products. So they're also using recyclable materials into the, the components themselves. Carbon fiber is great to make a lot of carpet. I don't know how much carpet we need globally, but it can be reused for that. Looking at every possible way, because fundamentally, the more that can be reused and recycled, the less waste there is, the more efficiencies, especially in the economies of manufacturing, can be achieved. Mm. There's some uh, 
a question about, you know, everybody's talking about the new evolution in the mobility or for the car industry. All the cars are going to become electric or they're going to become autonomous. They're going to become connected. They're going to become smart, etc., etc. Now, I don't know how fast this is going to go. Is it going to help us in the circular economy, all these new techniques, technologies? Yes. Um, in a way, yes. And in another way, it is going to generate another set of problems. Uh, yeah. um, so we have to address them. Fortunately, we are wise enough. We have learned through our mistakes and moving on uh, full electrification. We can always find a second use for the batteries. We can always, uh, uh, you know, have a better control over manufacturing and uh, uh, the, the material uh, recyclability, something which is very, very interesting for electric uh, batteries. Absolutely, and uh, lots of people are concerned by the yes. products which are in the battery, the metals. Uh, first of all, some are quite scarce, and we have to go and fetch them in different places. And of course, we need to recycle them. It can be a bit dirty, it can be you know, polluting. So of course, um, if you want to go electric, and most politicians want to go electric, you need to have uh, all the infrastructure, and one of very important part of the infrastructure is recycling the battery. Uh, producing mm -hmm. clean batteries, recycling them, etc. Let's hope it's going to come. Uh, there is something which also the second-hand cars. I mean, we're going to have a, a lot of different generations of cars together on the roads. You can have your smart cars, and as you said, Carla, one day you're going to have the smart cars and the dumb cars. Yep. And are they going to be able to speak together? I mean, it's, it's not going to be so simple. Yeah, in fact, just to correct you a little bit, smart and dumb is bad language, I was told. The dumb cars, you know, are, are legacy vehicles. They're not dumb. Um, so I have to get my political correctness. Uh, but we're going to have them together for a long time. Uh, fundamentally, you know, the average age of a car, you said 15 years. In the U.S., it's 12 years. And that's not going to get any better because cars aren't getting any more affordable. Uh, in the in the near term, especially with a number of the political things that are happening today, but um, fundamentally, those cars that uh, it it creates such a, a horrible engineering experiment. We'll put it this way: a, a human-driven car. Today, we know about 12 percent of what happens in this human brain, and therefore, there's. 88% that we don't know what that person behind the wheel is going to be doing. So to try to program this from an AI standpoint with all of the different situations that an autonomous vehicle is going to encounter when you have the legacy and the smart vehicles together is, is drastic. It's huge. And it's going to take us a long time to figure that out if we can ever figure it out and believe that these two products can coexist. So at least initially, we're going to see autonomous vehicles, and you're going to see them in geofenced areas where the roads are digitized, where the buildings, everything is mapped out, and it's only autonomous vehicles because they can communicate and, and know fundamentally what each other is doing. Now, the other interesting part of that is when you have a Waymo car with a GM car, with a Ford car, with a Tesla, they're all programmed differently. They all have different AI. So when you put all their brains together, who knows? This is why we have to have a lot of really robust testing, not only in, in contained test grounds but, and simulations, but also out on the, on the public roads. So it's going to be a while before we'll see even all autonomous vehicles together and then um, when I say all autonomous, that means from many different manufacturers. I think from one manufacturer, they can all go together because they all have the same brain. But it'll be a while for that, and then even longer while, if ever, that we'll be able to commingle. Jesus, we have already humans, it's difficult to communicate. If we have cars, we have a problem to communicate together. <laughs> it's a funny world. There's one thing, um, I was impressed in India because um, uh, there was a, 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 an effort to have small cars but the Indian people prefer the big cars. And, and the design of the car is, is, is important because cars have gained a lot of weight in the last years because of all the design, the, the safety features, uh, all the, you know, this is for you, make it beautiful, ta-ta-ti-ta-ta-ta. -ta -ta -ta. 
in the end, if we want to, to have less extractivism and better use of resources, cars must be light, must go quite slowly, I'm afraid, they use less uh, fuel or whatever, it's less dangerous. Uh, how can that happen? Is it, is it true or not true, what I'm saying? To be lighter, less resources inside of the car. I do agree with it, but um, they should not move slowly. They I don't know. <laughs> well, um, it's still an aspirational area to possess a car. So a small car is a small aspiration, bigger one, bigger aspiration. So that's, that's, right. that's the way I look at it. Uh, of course, uh, moving uh, from uh, um, this situation to a uh, more mobility-centric uh, solution is what is happening, especially in urban areas. Uh, so hopefully we will change. Yeah, the, the weight, just to give you an idea, the amount of weight it takes to put the advanced driver avoidance systems on, which is not even full automation. So your blind spot warning, your uh, advanced uh, uh, automatic emergency braking, et cetera, is around 200 kilograms. That has to be offset by you know, advances in materials, light weighting of materials, taking weight out of seats, you know, many, many different things. It has to be offset. In general, we've seen a slight increase over time in vehicle weight, at the same time counterbalanced by a reduction in, in um, uh, uh, greenhouse gas and an improvement in, in fuel economy. So the efficiencies are going the right direction. When you go into full autonomy, the amount of infrastructure that that requires in electronics even adds a greater amount of burden to that. And then people want, you know, 400 mile range with an electric vehicle. Sure. So it, it's, a, it's a dichotomy and struggle that the engineers are working on every single day. Yes, there's been a, long, a big discussion in, in Europe about the, the weight allowed for the, for the trucks, for the cargo. And um, of course, people say, well, the, the bigger the, the truck, the more it can carry, yeah. and you have less trucks in the end. But of course, the, the heavy, heavy trucks destroy the road. Yep. And if you have a carbon tax or a tax on the road, you have the revolution. So it's <laughs> not so easy to, do, to, to make your choice. So you know, that's policy making. Mm -hmm. We have very good questions. Will moving toward a circular economy require changes in consumer behavior? All those happening. Yes. Ah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Undoubtedly. Um, let me just add a, a few words about that. I think we have to start with kids and get them used to recycling immediately because to change behavior as an adult, what I've found is very, very difficult. And to move to mobility as a service, which I really believe is going to be necessary for the whole circular economy, get everybody out of their own vehicle, that's gonna mean people giving up their personal mobility security blanket, that's their car, that's that thing that costs about $750 a month that you only use 5% of the time. But to do that, you have to have an option that you feel comfortable and will integrate into your daily life seamlessly. So we have to provide those options if you really want to drive human behavior change. I think that's going to be one of the toughest ones. We've already seen it with electrification. Electric cars are available everywhere, but people aren't buying them. You can't, just because you offer it doesn't mean people are going to feel comfortable buying it. It requires a change in behavior and mindset. So you say it's happening. Is it happening also in India? Yes. Good. Well, um, uh, it takes some time to, you know, to get familiar with uh, driving, uh, with the road, with the safety. It's, 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 it take does time. take time. So, there is a lot of questions about the batteries, of course, and so we, 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 we did talk about the batteries. You know, it's very interesting if you make a big model with electric, electric cars, the model of the battery helping the grid. Uh, and it doesn't take much electricity. It changes the peak when everybody with the electric car goes back home and plugs the car. So, so the, 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 the utility must try ask the people to, to plug it a bit later in the night or something like that. But otherwise it can help and, and provide a lot of electricity when you need it at peak hours. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be the... I'm speaking, on, on, instead of you, I'm sorry, it's not going to be only the, the car make or the, or the, it's going to be the whole of the system which has to accommodate the new cars and, and the new transportation. I think that's one of the lessons here, 
it's not the industry alone. It has to be everybody. Yeah, the complete ecosystem needs to address this issue. Okay, the bus model from M, what is MAAS is currently limited by service providers joking for ownership. How do we shift to holistic total value versus fragmentation? I don't know what, what MAAS Mobility is. Mobility as a service. Okay, so you can answer that then. <laughs> well, I can answer that part um, because nobody's figured out the economics yet. Everybody, there supposedly is $2.1 trillion in data of mobility as a service. That's the value. Um, but nobody so far has been successful. A lot of people are trying to, to, it's all about the data, it's understanding the customer, it's them being able to sell elements to the customer while they're uh, a, a riding in this autonomous vehicle or renting this, this product, whatever. But, um, I think we have to keep trying and see what's going to work. Okay. Everyone's trying to figure it out. Okay, I have a question uh, from Felipe Arroz Galarza. How? Oh, it's, I lost it. I don't know where. Okay, somebody took it away from me. <laughs> oh, sometimes they get lower in priority if people are liking them. Okay, well, let's begin. <laughs> How do you ensure that cars or spare parts are reused even before being recycled, as it is more interesting on an environmental level? So how can we reuse before recycling? That is repairing, yeah. I suppose. Yes, I, I, I guess uh, there is a complete system uh, and, uh, which uh, ensures that spare parts are marked, they are traced, and obviously repair of spare parts is a very big opportunity. And uh, this also is what is happening uh, in India. Uh, it's just that uh, um, it's, uh, it's rather uncontrolled. So one is not sure whether the spurious part is put or otherwise. So I, I, f I found again Philippe's question, so that's good. I don't know if you no, don't, don't move. How to make electric or autonomous vehicles available for people with lower incomes who can barely afford the uh, current vehicle. So it's, the, it's, the, it's, a, it's an important question. I mean, in, in France, it's an important question now because we would like to yeah. help people to go to yeah. buy electric cars, to replace the polluting car by a, a clean car, and it's a difficult uh, problem. Well, even to buy a, a, a non-electric car today is, is becoming untenable for many, many people with the average price around $41,000, creeping up now towards $43,000. I mean, you just, it's almost impossible for several people. When you think about what we could do, though, with an integrated multimodality society, if you have good public transit, plus first mile, last mile service, there are some companies that uh, have little two-seater electric vehicles that it can be at the end of a rail line, at a, at a depot, can be at the end of a bus line. And they are actually employing people in those communities, and many of them underserved populations, to be able to provide rides back and forth and maintain those vehicles. So they're employed by that company, so they're getting some wages, and then they're able to keep the rides in the $1 to $2 range. Combining that, of course, with there will probably be advertising and, and other ways that maybe you can sit in a vehicle. These are some ideas that I've heard. Sit in a vehicle, watch a, a commercial, let's say, and if you watch it and rate it and share your demographics and, and data, then you can get the ride for free. Now, you can opt out and then pay for it. But it's another way, kind of like cell phones if you want to use Wi-Fi in certain places. So there's a lot of ideas like this coming about because if you think about you know, the mobility, it has to be mobility for all and rides have to be democratized. Because, and that is for every element of our population because mobility provides ladders of opportunity. Yes, if I can just add something uh, in, in France, for instance, uh, the problem is the upfront investment for the car. But once you've got your car, to charge your electric car is much less costly than to, to fill up with the, with the gasoline. Indeed. Uh, and funnily enough, it's in the rural areas where you find electric cars because you have less and less pumps with gasoline. They disappear. And people are sort of have to be able to park the car and to plug it in their own uh, system, in their sockets. 
So there was an important question which I, I, I think is, we should consider. Behavioral change towards bicycles and multimodal should be a larger part of this conversation. I ah. do agree. <laughs> I do agree. None of us, of course, is an expert on transport engineering. At least I am not. I'm an automotive expert. So my discussion is obviously coming from that uh, viewpoint. But as a uh, social uh, viewpoint, this is absolutely right. We must look at other uh, opportunities. Yes. I, I think there's, we're going to see a whole rash of new products coming out that uh, can, can be utilized by mem many members of our population. You've got the um, you know, the, the gray tsunami or the, you know, the retirees that, that are just, you know, starting to, to overpopulate the world. And most of them are going to be without a license for the last 10 years of their life. That's a lot of people that are going to need to get around and a bicycle may not work for them. So we're going to have to have other modes. I'm also a big advocate of using your feet. You know, we, we don't walk enough uh, in general, in, especially in the States. And, uh, you know, why not? Why shouldn't, when you're given a menu of options to, to be mobile in a community, one of those should be walking and it should be connected to this thing so that somebody will remind you, hey, use your feet. Um, but definitely in multi, multi-modality is required. It's the only way we're going to eliminate the congestion problem. Yes. We don't want... And clean up our air. We don't want congestion. <laughs> That's okay. Um, there is a question I don't understand, but so you will probably be able to answer. Do you consider geofencing, I don't know what that means, as a part of the solution for overcrowded, polluted cities? What is geofencing? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, go ahead. You go first. You mean closing some quarters? Basically, just fencing off an area where ah. only you know autonomous vehicles okay, okay. or or you know okay. suit. So what do you think? That's yeah. an important yeah, question too. Yes, it's. Uh, Land use and city planning, uh, how do we organize Urban it? planning, everything. Zero Every emission quarters? All, or? Yeah, all those aspects can address it, I'm sure. And uh, uh, decongestion uh, is one of those uh, you know, possible solutions. I, I, I was told that some, some cities, like Singapore, to not to, to name it, they have a ratio. The part of the surface of the land devoted to transport system or to mobility mustn't be over 15% or something like that of the total land. I mean, these ideas of the surface and, and what, what is the place or the surface given to mobility is perhaps an interesting thing to explore. I, I think it's really important. To, what I say is we need to take urban planning and turn it on its head. You know, especially in the states where we design everything around parking lots and uh, and around you know roads, we need to make buildings and cities inhabitable and livable and nice places to live, and then figure out the best way to move people about and bring goods uh, into the city. And it requires a complete change, even of how you do deliveries of, of products and goods, you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing those during the day. You know, completely different and utilizing, you know, two wheelers to do some deliveries and really thinking about curb space and how you design and, and lay out the new buildings. There is a question about uh, a fear about electric vehicles is that once electricity companies they could take over the transport energy market and they, would, they could drastically hike up prices. Is that possible? And how do we overcome that? Can you repeat the question? Are the electricity companies going to overtake the mobility market and uh, put up prices? <laughs> that's the first one I hear, that one. But uh, <laughs> Well, um, that's a good threat for those who are working differently in the cities. Uh, the way we look at it is they are at least coming on the same table uh, where we are addressing the issues related to transportation. So there's a lot of uh, exchange happening between the uh, energy providers. Um, they are ready to change the rules to a certain extent whereby uh, energy uh, becomes much more um, easily accessible, easily, uh, you know, pay by the use kind of a concept. So it is changing. I think we're going to get to the last question. It's a funny one, this one. Can we, uh, I would say, ask the advertising company to help us um, uh, um, to, to, to push, to promote the circular economy instead of 
always wanting to sell more cars. Uh, sorry, was the advertising companies to do what? To help us to go to a circular economy instead of always wanting us to buy more cars. Well, the, there's an interesting thing about that. And uh, it, you're seeing a lot of companies now, their advertisements are not about their product anymore. It's about what they're doing to improve the environment, what they're doing in the education world. Because when you think about the triple R of companies and the, and the triple net worth, it, that is a big part of the equation. So I think we're starting to see it. Um, but still, those old ways die hard. And, but they're going to have to change their way fundamentally because people aren't even watching TV anymore. I mean, advertising is nearly taboo for the younger population. It's going to change. Good. So as we can see, um, uh, the future of the automotive industry and us is in good hands. So I would think a good <laughs> round of applause to them. Thank you.